so Tommy Emmanuel, what have you been doing other than playing your guitar in your house, which which okay. you do beautifully, and frankly, it's great great to see you uh, in in your house with the guitar. How happy have you been? Well, I've been as happy as I can be. Um, <clears throat> I have a bit of a frog in my throat today, uh, and believe me, it was a lot worse yesterday. So I think I have some allergy stuff going on. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, and there's always a lot of allergies. And, you know, the, the native people who lived here before we white folk did, um, uh, they used to call Nashville uh, the Valley of Sickness. And it's kind of in a valley, it's in a low part. And uh, they all moved out into the mountains to get health, you know. Um, but we, we guitar players uh, hang out in Nashville. And um, I've been, I haven't been playing a real lot. I've done, um, when COVID hit, um, I was shut down, uh, I think it was April, first week of April. And um, uh, yeah, I had to stop touring and sent my lighting man back home to Chicago and my sound man back home to um, Kansas City. And I flew into uh, San Jose uh, and uh, I had a little apartment there for a while and I did all my Facebook Live and Instagram Live uh, shows where I live streamed playing. Uh, I did that from my house in uh, in San Jose. And now I've, um, the last couple of months, I've been here in Nashville and uh, I've been on the Opry a couple of times um, and I've uh, recorded a whole bunch of stuff and some live streaming. And uh, this weekend I'll be mixing uh, uh, some new Christmas music that we recorded it last year. And I'll have a chance to, you know, I have, now I have time to sit and go through everything and get a live Christmas album together. So there's that. Uh, so have, so San, San Jose is, is uh, not a place, I, I picture it as, as a center of, of great musicians, uh, but it's, no. it's a pretty techy place for you to hang out, isn't it? Well, my wife works at Apple. Okay, so, there we go. Yeah, so she can uh, she can have it, and I'll be here in Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> so, so before we talk about the Christmas album, which would be nice to talk about, it's amazing that it's uh, getting to be that that time already. We're coming into, I guess, we're well yeah. into fall. Or, or I, I keep saying to people, we're, we're coming into fall, but but we're no longer coming into fall. We're in fall. No, we're in fall, yeah. <laughs> well, the amount of leaves that came, were coming down yesterday, I, I kicked myself. I didn't have my phone with me because it would have made some incredible footage if you put it into black and white and slow it down of all these leaves coming down. They were just constantly coming down like that. We had a big wind came through yesterday here, and it was incredible. I didn't have my phone with me. Oh, well, that same thing happened where I am right now in rural New Hampshire. A big wind and, and, and the leaves are, are incredible colors, but you're hoping that the wind doesn't come through because th then they're all gone and, and they're on the road, the yeah. car drives over them. <laughs> it's a shame, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Those so, autumn leaves are by my window. You know, even with a frog in your throat, you have a, a great voice, I gotta oh. say. <laughs> yeah, I... Um, it's a funny thing, uh, when I meet up with Australians, they all think I've lost my accent, and I haven't. I've just always talked like this. Um, I've never been one of those Aussies that we went, good eye, mate, how you going, all right, yeah, you know what I mean? Like that real kind of redneck way of speaking Australian. Um, uh, you know, when, when people say, oh, you lost your accent, I say, no, I just don't talk like you. You know, <laughs> you, you, you know what's, what I always found interesting about accents in uh, speech versus in singing is that music always seemed to delete any sign of an accent. It's I, I know yeah. people who have super heavy accents when they speak English, when they sing, they, they sound like like it's their first language. It's very strange. I, I always wondered why. 
Yeah, well, it's because most of the music that we like is either from America or England. There you go. <laughs> okay. so, so everybody, even Australians, sing with an American accent or an English accent. Um, there's only a very few people who sing like a real Australian accent, like, uh, you know, um, it was somewhere in September and the sun was going down when I came in search of copy to a darling river town. That's typical Australian. You know, we don't know a lot of music uh, from Australia. You, you've not lived in Australia for a long time, Tommy yeah. Emanuel. Let's, let's, 98 let's, I left. 98. So, yeah. so let's, let's go back uh, to the roots, if you will. You had music in, in your in your blood from a young age, yeah. uh, super gifted. But talk about w when you reached that time, when, when you knew you were talented. I mean, I, I, as, a, as a cellist, I, I, I know the feeling when, when you know there's some talent. But, but then there's sort of a moment where it becomes your life. I remember, I remember with me, I started cello at age four and a half, and it just, there was nothing else to do. There was no other option. Right. Well, I have, um, I have played the guitar since I was four years old, but I never wanted to do anything else. You know, I, uh, I've been very fortunate. There we go, it sounds a bit better in here. Oh, that's yeah. nice. Yeah, I, that's I thought you were going to bring us to the guitar room. No. Uh, the, oh, there are guitars in this room. There's guitars in every room. You're, you're but, welcome um, to pick one up anytime you want. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I started... I, I, I was always interested in music. In fact, I can go right back to the cradle, really, because my mother used to say to me that I would not sleep unless she put my my um, pr pram next to the record player and put music on and then I would sleep. And then when the music stopped, I woke up and howled my lungs out until she turned the music over. And then and I'd play the other side and I would go back to sleep. She told me that my first words were, turn it over. That's the first thing I said <laughs> in, in my, with my mouth. Which would have very little relevance to a, a kid today, but I, I, I know what you're talking about. Yes, exactly. <laughs> turn the record over. Uh, turn the record over. So yeah. what, what, what early, early, early music memories, what, what were you listening to? What, what was, what was uh, we keeping, listening keeping you to, up at night? Um, at night, we would listen to um, Jim Reeves, uh, Marty Robbins, uh, Hank Williams, Jimmy Rogers. It was all American country music. That's what we mostly listened to. And, oh, brilliant. Talk about brilliant music. And, um, and then whatever was on the radio. Uh, I remember, I can still remember the first time I heard the Beatles, you know. And she loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the first thing I heard by the Beatles on the radio. And then uh, Please Please Me and, and uh, All My Lovin', all those great songs. We heard them all on the radio, and um, they were such an inspiration to us. I can still remember my mother saying, don't listen to that rubbish, talking about the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> when you talk about becoming a professional musician, what did it mean to you when, when you were a kid, when you were practicing, when you were playing? What, yeah. when, talk about this, this idea that, wow, this is maybe a life here and not just a, a thing I pick up for some fun. Oh, that school. happened straight away. We, by the time I was five years old, we were already playing out. We were playing at, um, you know, functions, at church, uh, in, in the hospital for the patients. We were already running around playing all the time. By the time I was six years old, we were entering in band contests and stuff like that. And we were winning all the time because we were little and we could actually play. So it was a revelation to people. Because we were little kids, six, eight, twelve, my eldest brother, my sister was about ten, and we could actually play. That that's the. It wasn't just like a performing monkey uh, uh, thing that you'd see in the circus. This is people. This is little kids, uh, earnestly and honestly playing music. 
And uh, my brother and I, we taught us, we taught each other kind of thing. He showed me how to understand chords and how the song worked. And I worked out how to play the, the rhythm and I was his accompanist. My brother Phil was the lead guitar player. But that all changed when we got a little older and I actually started to work out how to play some Chet Atkins music um, when I was about 10. Um, I started playing some of Chet's tunes and got a spot in the show on my own where I would play that style. And people were always saying, oh, there's a, he's, got a, he's got a tape recorder backstage with all the other parts on it and he's just playing one part. But I was actually doing everything at once, the bass, the chords and the melody all at the same time. Talk about that technique, these these complex finger techniques. What, what do you what do you do every day? First of all, obviously, technique isn't something that that you, quote, learn and then you have it and then it sticks forever. This, this is something that has to be has to be maintained. You, you know, the, there, there was yeah. a great um, the, the great quote that I, I like from Yasha Heifetz, maybe the greatest violin player in the 20th century, who said, if I miss a day of practicing, I notice. If I miss two days, my wife notices. If I miss three days, the public notices. Yeah. You know, what What, what do you do in terms of, of maintaining the technique, obviously? as, as You've got to play all the time. Play all the time. Yeah. Talk about yeah. playing for yourself when you listen to yourself, when you yeah. practice and analyze. What, what, what is that all about? It's about you trying to do it well. That's all. Um, uh, it should look easy, be easy, uh, even real hard stuff. You've got to get it to a point where you can just pick up the guitar and play those tunes that are really difficult. You can get through them, you know, and you've just got to keep at it. Technique to me is it should be invisible. It's the music and the musical statement that you're making that is what is what should be seen and heard. Um, it, it's in service of the music, right? The technique is 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 there to serve the music, not to serve exactly. itself. Yeah. No, that's right. Um, well, my job as a musician is to serve the music and serve it to the public so that they can enjoy it. You know, that's that's really what I'm I'm all about. Is I'll play my I always go out there with the attitude to do my absolute best. And I try to give it all away every time so I can get a chance to do it again tomorrow. But I have to give it up, give it all out today. It's something Janusz Starker spoke about a lot. The the definition of a professional having to do with consistency, being able to do it yeah. night after night, not just that, oh, I, I had a good night tonight. Things went really well. Uh, but that that good night is is your standard. Well, it should be, it should be, you know, because uh, when I teach workshops and stuff, I always say to the students. Even on my worst night, I can still have a good show because I've got some good songs and good arrangements. So even if I'm not feeling inspired or energetic or I'm, I'm not, you know, I feel a little flat, maybe I'm tired, I don't know. But if I'm not feeling 100% and I'm, I feel like I'm struggling with it, um, at least I know I've got some great songs and some wonderful arrangements that I can count on, I can stand on, even on my worst night. I'm still going to do a, the best job I can. But, you know, I go out there to fly my kite to see how wonderful it can be if you, uh, with improvisation and stuff like that. I just let it fly and, and I follow my instincts and I'm very much, I'm very, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, uh, spontaneous. You talk about arrangements. What does that word mean to you? What is a good arrangement? But pretend that, that you're speaking to someone who has no clue what okay. the heck you're talking about. What is an arrangement to begin with? It, it, it's really about surprising you. You know, if I play a song that I know you'll probably know, I want to do something with it that makes it, uh, that is not the normal and that, that surprises the listener. 
So I have an arrangement of the Carpenters song, uh, Close to You, and I changed a lot of the things about it. The melody remains the same. You have to play the melody as it was written, um, and Hal David and Bert Bacharach wrote that song, and Bert Bacharach's melodies are just the best. Um, and so I came up with all these kind of alternative chords. Let me just uh, grab a guitar and I'll show you what I mean. Wow, I, I didn't think you'd actually do it when I said feel free to pick up a guitar. Oh, yeah. There's guitars here. Then. So close to you weren't expecting that that chord close to you and the bridge in a completely different chord. So what I'm trying to do is make my arrangement interesting all the way. So you can, it's, you never know what's going to happen next. And, um, and so that's what, that's what, I, that's what I, I learned from li listening to all my heroes, those who played things well, um, that you know, you, you've got to, got to play the melody as a composer intended. But you can put that different chords and, and things that surprise the listener. Yeah. Do you know who Penn and Teller are? Yes. Yeah. yeah well, but, but, but before you say, I just want to say one thing about what you just played, if you don't mind, before yeah. Penn and Teller, I just want to say that two things, and people are going to think I'm going way into the weeds, but I'll go into the weeds briefly. I love the key of F major. You're playing the song in F major. It's a beautiful, warm key, F major. It's, 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 no, it's always that there's that pastoral quality to F major. And of course, when you do an arrangement, you can pick whatever key you want. Exactly. I love that you played an F major, and I love that you ended on this big open augmented chord, these major, major chords, these yeah, big yeah, yeah. open sevens. I love it. Thank you. Well, that, that, that's because they're, they're good for your ear, right? It, they're, they're very good for your ear. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You talk about, talk about creating an atmosphere with two notes. It's just, it was just yeah. great. Well, let me tell you that... that um, if you just play it like the carpenters saying it, it's already been done. The carpenters have done it better than you can, right? So you, if, you, if you're going to do, and the reason I came up with that arrangement is because I was asked to contribute a song to an album that was, that was the album itself was a, a tribute to Bert Bacharach, and, and the album was called This Guitar's In Love With You, and because uh, this guy's in love is one of, of, of his songs. So nobody wanted to do uh, clo Close to You. No, no of the other guitar players who were um, approached, none of them wanted to touch Close to You. Um, and so I took it upon myself to come up with that arrangement. And uh, pe people loved it. And so many, especially people from China and Japan, you know, every young Asian guitar player worked out my arrangement of close to you and uh, and so everybody was playing it and then sending me their videos of them playing it and it was a wonderful feeling that i had come up with something that really struck a chord with the younger generation around the world even though it was a song uh, i think close to you came out in about 69 or something like that you bring up a couple things i i, I was thinking when you mentioned arrangements i was thinking recently that I was listening to, I've, I've been 
I've been having Beethoven on my mind a lot recently. I, I don't know if you, you saw, but there was a big kerfuffle online about Beethoven, and there was a publication that, that said Beethoven 5 is, is elitist and exclusionary, and I was asked to write a rebuttal to that, which I, I wrote very strongly. And I was thinking about, about the freshness I hear in a Beethoven symphony. And, oh. uh, and e- each time I hear it, and, and someone sent me the... Um, transcriptions that listed of Beethoven symphonies for solo piano. And I put on Beethoven five played by a pianist. I love old, old German pianists from the mid century. And I was hearing it fresh. I was hearing Beethoven for solo piano, the symphony transcribed just for two hands. And I was, I was reminded of the vitality in a new way. Of course, every time I play Mm -hmm. the piece, it it blows me away with, with the punchiness and and the and the freshness and the originality. But when I heard it on yeah. the piano, it was a whole new experience. Uh, how beautiful! Well, you know, that's it's up to the person to bring that bring that uh, arrangement to life. You know, and um, so you know, I don't play any Beethoven's pieces, but I sure think his music is is monumental you know he's a he's like the greatest juggernaut in music that's a good way of putting it i tommy Manuel, you know we we've been talking about music in different ways let, let me just ask you the the question that everybody gets asked as you know what which is basically what have you been listening to recently that you mentioned a few people that you love but what have you been listening yeah. to recently that maybe you rediscovered that, that you had forgotten about or that you want people to, when they're done listening to this podcast, go online or their player and put on? Mm-hmm. Well, lately I've been listening to Merle Haggard, um, uh, his album Hag, and an album called Let Me Tell You About a Song. I love the songs on that, and his singing uh, is just beautiful. Um, And I've been playing James Taylor's Gorilla album, which is from the early 70s. And the other album I listened to was um, New Moonshine, which has um, Lord Have Mercy on the Frozen Man, has the the Frozen Man on it, Uh, another brilliant song of James Taylor's. So that's what I've been listening to. I very rarely ever listen to guitar music. You know, I listen to singers and songwriters. That's what I like. Carol King, James Taylor, Billy Joel, Elton John, Stevie Wonder, Sting. You know, there, that's my diet right there. That's what I like to consume. Why do you think this, this is a tough question? This is, but I, I'm always curious to ask a musician what, what, they, what they think about this. Why do you think a piece of music, you mentioned came out in 1969 a few minutes ago. What, right. Why is a piece of music 50 years later as appealing and as relevant as when it came out. What is that all about? Because it's good and it's well written and it, it'll stand the test of time. You know, I bet you anything you like, if Hank Williams uh, suddenly appeared and sa- uh, the first thing you'd ask him is, oh, sing Lovesick Blues, you know, the, and he would blow your mind right now. And yet, you know, the songs from the late 40s. Uh, but it's incredible. And, you know, what happens if um, someone who's popular these days, uh, let's let's say, uh, um, oh, what's her name? Anyway, if somebody appeared who was a good singer, you know, um, Celine Dion or someone like that, and you said seeing somewhere over the rainbow, you know, it would be a mind blowing experience because those songs are so great. It doesn't matter that they're old and they've been heard a thousand times. They're good. And if someone does it with all their heart, it's going to really, you know, make you cry and make you feel full of emotion and enjoy the, the whole experience. I had a music theory professor and anybody who knows me knows i'm big on music big on playing and listening i'm much less big on uh the musicology and music theory side of music that's not my right. field and yeah. i don't even understand most of it i i proudly say but i did have a, a music theory teacher once who, who told me that she thought this was a, a scholar of uh, stravinsky and schoenberg and and not 
someone to listen to this music, but she said she thought Somewhere Over the Rainbow was one of the great melodies ever written in history, period. Yeah. And, and I, I said, well, I really yeah. respect you a lot more for saying that. Yeah, it's absolutely true. And the same thing with Imagine, John Lennon's song. That's one of the greatest songs ever written. You know, yeah, it, It's a beautiful song. I, I, I had a, an album of, of all Harold Arlen uh, stuff that I was... Oh, fantastic. Uh, to me, it just doesn't. I mean, it's not music that I play. I wish I did, but you know, we do it at Pop's concert or whatever. But but I I think it's as satisfying as a Rossini or whatever. Totally, it is. It is. Um, you know, and it, well, Claude Debussy, uh, it was you know, the musical kinky guy who, you know, who uh, made everything always slightly off center and. And unusual and unpredictable and oh, incredible, you know. So, you know, and the same thing. Stevie Wonder uh, does the same thing. He'll surprise you all the time. What I was going to tell you about Penn and Teller was that Penn was interviewed, and the young guy who interviewed him said, "What? What is entertainment?" Like that. Ask him the question. What is entertainment? And he said, "Surprise me." He said, no, no, what is entertainment? He said, yeah, surprise me. That was the answer. So that is the reason why I play those unusual chords in Close to You is it surprises the listener every time. So I'm, in other words, I can play Close to You, a song that's been played to death a million times, but I can still make it entertaining for a guy like you because I, I make sure that the chords are not exactly what you're expecting, but the melody is there. But they work somehow. That's, that, that's, that's totally. a beautiful, that's a beautiful line. It's in the name there. of entertainment. It's in the name of entertainment, and that's it, you know. Is, is, does entertainment get a, get a bad rap? Does a word entertainment have, a, have a, a, a sort of lower connotation than it deserves? Don't you think entertainment is, is, is what's holding the world together right now? Totally. Yeah, without entertainment, we're, we're, our lives would be incredibly uh, harder and and much more boring. Um, you know, that's why. You know, I, I don't, I don't feel like, like I'm serious about my music, and it has to be on a certain level. And you know, I know that 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 what there has to be is uh, quality, integrity, and everything it has to have all that. And but I still have to re be reminded that I am in the entertainment business. My job is to entertain people, and I'll do whatever I can. I'll I'll take on anything. I'll, you know, the old thing of playing the guitar and picking up a brush and playing the guitar with the brush. So what are you doing right now? You mentioned a Christmas album. What else day to day? Yeah, um, I'm re I'm going to be re recording some songs with my good friend Richard Smith. Uh, he's an English guitar player who lives here in Nashville. And him and I are going to do a kind of Chet Atkins and Jerry Reed type of package where we, we play some fingerstyle tunes and he'll play uh, nylon string and I'll play steel string. And, and we'll, we'll do, do duets. So we'll do like four songs or something, six songs maybe, if we have enough. And I'm also recording with um, Rob Ikes and Trey Hensley, uh, and they're genius. Rob Ikes is an incredible uh, Dobro player, and uh, Trey is a guitar player. So the three of us will do some recording as well. Um, and, and is that done in, in the house? Is that done or in, in no, home? No, I'll do it out at – Richard Smith has a studio in a place called Goodlettsville. So we'll, we'll go out there and record. So you have that coming up. You have a few other things. You have stuff of your own. Uh, yeah. As as uh, as fall goes into winter, what's what's going to be happening? You're going to be writing new songs. You're going to be doing I'm hoping new arrangements. To, I'm, I'm hoping to get into writing mode. Um, it's not something that you can force. You know, music you, is not made to be forced. Uh, it's got to come and flow through you. Uh, and you know, some days I pick up the guitar. And I'm waiting. I start playing stuff, and I'm improvising, and 
I'm waiting for something to happen, waiting for something to stick out to me. Other times, like uh, when I wrote certain songs, the melody came to me in my head straight away and I picked up the guitar and started writing and then I finished it off. So that's, that's inspiration that you're always waiting for. Um, a, a songwriter waits patiently for something to happen so he can write about it. How much of your real life, of your emotions, of your interactions, how much of all of that goes into the music? Imagine you can't separate it. You can't, no. It's, it's all what's going on in my inner life. Um, when I, something has inspired me. Say, for instance, uh, there's a song I wrote called Old Photographs. And I wrote that because I watched the movie Lincoln and I was so inspired and transformed by that movie. You know, it's a Steven Spielberg masterpiece. And it reminded me of the t my time with my grandparents. And my grandmother would open these old cookie tins and they were bulging with hundreds of old photographs of my family, my ancestors, and my uncles, uh, and all that sort of stuff. So um, I went back to my hotel and I got my guitar and I wrote that song in no time because I was so inspired. And that's what you're always waiting for. You're waiting to get into that place of being inspired. I imagine there's going to be a lot of young aspiring, uh, hopefully inspiring at some point, guitarists listening to this conversation. What, what do you think they should take away? You, you bring, I'll just say what I hear, and, and, and then, then you can answer my question. You, well, you, you, you bring a richness and, and a variety of backgrounds to your music making. I think you have very right. eclectic taste in music, and Thank I you. think you have very high standards for yourself. And I think those two things combined make for a very compelling musical figure. What should young people take away from you? It's all about the quality and integrity of your music. Um, don't forget to play the melody. Can you hear the melody? Can you feel it? All that sort of stuff. It's like, um, it's easy to play a whole bunch of notes and play fast and be impressive, but it's all about emotion. You got to tap into the emotion of music. And, uh, you know, I'd done my share of showing off when I was young, uh, as most of us do, if we have something to show off. But at the same time, I always make sure that I play songs that are really from my heart um, and that they, they're designed to take you to another place, take the listener with you kind of thing. Um, so I'm hoping that I'll write some more songs soon, you know. Uh, that's what I'm waiting for. Tommy Emanuel, you're great. I hope you'll come back and uh, talk to me more sometime. All right. Well, thanks for having me, Daniel. And um, I sure do appreciate it. And uh, thanks for doing this podcast. Uh, it's been fun.